these questions. There are other things like uh, nature's favoritism. Nature has chosen to have matter over antimatter. At the origin of the universe, uh, we believe that equal amounts of matter and antimatter were created, and somehow the antimatter has disappeared. And how has it disappeared is the question we're trying to understand. There are also secrets of the Big Bang. What was life uh, like uh, within the first uh, second of uh, the universe's life? And the question that was on the Scientific American, can physics be unified? So let me now go to the science and see what tools are needed uh, to do this kind of science. So clearly we need accelerators. We need powerful machines that accelerate particles to very high energies. And as I mentioned, they bring them into collision uh, with other particles. The next thing we need are detectors to detect the particles that come out of from the collisions that I just mentioned. Uh, these are gigantic instruments that uh, record the resulting particles as they stream out from the uh, point of collision. The next thing we need are, are computers. So this is where uh, uh, all the uh, work that has been done by uh, Intel has uh, come into play because we use uh, uh, these very high speed processes uh, to collect, store, distribute, and analyze the vast amount of data uh, that these detectors will be producing. And I'll give you some indication of that uh, later. And finally, people. Only a worldwide collaboration, uh, as has been mentioned uh, by the speaker who introduced me, uh, each of these experiments has about 2,500 people from about 40 countries. And their talents and their resources are all needed to make the detectors that I'll show you in a few minutes. Now, let me spend a few minutes on particle accelerators. So as I said, these accelerate particles to high energies. Now, why do we need high energies? The first thing to look at is, uh, is a relation which was uh, uh, first put forward by a French uh, physicist called De Broglie uh, to look deeper into matter. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, you need higher energies because there's a relation which uh, relates energy inversely to the size that you want to look at. So these are really very powerful microscopes. The next thing is the famous relation of uh, uh, Einstein, which is E equals mc squared. So if you want to make particles uh, which are heavy, which are yet undiscovered, then you need to have high energies. So this is why where particle accelerators come in. The last thing is, if you want to probe conditions of the early universe, there's a relation uh, by another physicist, an Austrian physicist uh, called Boltzmann, which relates energy to temperature. So when you go to high energies, you go to high temperatures, and these are the temperatures that existed in the early parts early uh, moments uh, after the Big Bang. So you're going back in time, in fact. Now, so we are actually revisiting uh, the early moments of our ancestral universe. In that sense, it, this makes them powerful telescopes as well, as well as microscopes. So we, to observe phenomena and particles that no, uh, are normally no longer uh, visible or existing in our time. So that's the, uh, uh, the uh, mission, if you like. And all of this is done in a controlled way. Now, this is the aerial view of the site at CERN. Uh, so you can see uh, the Lake of Geneva on the right-hand side, the airport of Geneva. On the left-hand side, there are mountains. On the left-hand side is France. On the right-hand side is Switzerland, in fact. And the tunnel that is uh, traced over there is 100 meters underground. It's 27 kilometers in length. And it has four experiments, two big ones, which are CMS and Atlas. I will con be concentrating on CMS, uh, uh, since I know quite a bit about that one. Uh, and there are two smaller experiments, uh, one which is called LHCB, which is trying to understand the difference between matter and antimatter and how uh, matter won over antimatter. And ALICE, uh, which is actually using uh, very high energy uh, nuclei of lead. They smashed into each other. The violence of the collision is so, uh, so much that uh, the protons and neutrons actually melt into quarks and gluons, which are the constituents of these particles, and you create a quark-gluon plasma. This is the sort of thing that would have existed uh, in the early universe, one microsecond after the Big Bang. And so you try to study the state of matter at that time and learn from that. Now, CERN itself uh, is a, a multinational organization. It is a European organization. It's 20 uh, member states. It's a six observer states. Uh, US is one of the observer states, and you can see uh, in blue are the member states, in green are the, uh, 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 the uh, observer states, and there are about 60 countries and about 9,000 scientists who work there. So truly international, very much like the audience that we have here today. Uh, so now the protons start the journey as electrons stripped off hydrogen atom. They're accelerated, as you see, one uh, bunches at a time, and they go into a, 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 a 
medium sized ring and then into the larger size ring. And then you have another beam. Uh, one is fed uh, clockwise, the other one is fed anti clockwise, and they meet, uh, brought into collision at the point where there's a cylindrical detector. Uh, and uh, at the moment of collision, afterwards, the particles stream outwards. Now, uh, the uh, energy that these particles acquire uh, can be equated in terms of the energy equivalent of the mass of a proton. So they start uh, in the medium sized ring, they get to 450 times the mass of the proton in the bigger ring to about 7,000 times. Uh, and this is a typical detector, if you like. It has a, a, a high energy physics detector. It has four principal layers. And each layer has a particular function. And all of these layers together allow us to measure the energy and the direction and the identity of all the particles that are produced in the collision. And from the pattern of the energy deposit, for example, in green, you can see there's the second layer firing. In uh, red is the third layer firing. The first one, you can see the tracks. And right on the uh, side there, you'll see the uh, fourth layer firing. So from there, you can actually tell what particle has been produced. Now, the accelerator itself is a, uh, is a very uh, state-of-the-art machine, if you wish. Uh, they accelerate by powerful electric fields, uh, very close to the speed of light. And they are guided in a circular path by very strong uh, uh, magnets, very powerful superconducting magnets. Uh, in fact, the dipole magnets, which is a dipole field, which keeps the uh, protons as they accelerate into the orbit uh, in this 27 kilometer uh, ring, they operate it at 8.3 Tesla, which is about 200,000 times the magnetic field of the Earth. And they run at uh, 1.9 degrees Kelvin, which is minus 271 degrees uh, in a bath of uh, superfluid helium. And the protons travel in this tube, uh, which is under a better vacuum and at a lower temperature than in interplanetary space. So these are extreme engineering, if you wish. Uh, and uh, just to give you an idea, uh, we have this acceler accelerator here in, uh, in the US, the Tevatron, which is uh, hunting for the Higgs boson, uh, as we speak, in fact. Uh, and uh, to compare it, uh, the LHC with that uh, accelerator, the energy is about seven times. And the number of times the protons collide uh, per second is about 30 times larger. So this machine is actually a marvel of technology, and I won't have time to actually explain all the technology behind this machine. Now, let me come to the experiments. Uh, I'll say something about the sociology and also about the construction assembly to give you some idea uh, of the uh, uh, work that has been required to bring the experiments to the point where we are ready to start taking data. The accelerator and the experiments uh, are arguably the most complex scientific scientific instruments ever built. And I'll try to give you some idea of that in the rest of my talk. Now, looking at the collaboration itself, I just got a transparency which shows on the left-hand side in numbers the CMS, on right-hand side, uh, Atlas. And this has been mentioned already, so I'll skip over this one. Now, this is a view of the experiment. So I mentioned that the uh, experiments look like cylindrical onions. If I take a transverse cut, this is what you will see uh, in terms of the CMS experiment. So this is the uh, Atlas experiment, uh, which is an iconic picture you might have seen. And the next one is uh, uh, an engineering challenge. So I'll pick on engineering challenge and another challenge. Uh, the engineering is this uh, coil which sits in the heart of the CMS experiment. It has uh, about 20,000 amps that goes through a superconducting cable, which is shown in here. It's, just, uh, it, it's been produced in about five or six countries. It has to be perfect, and it's about uh, something of the order of uh, uh, 50 kilometers of uh, such cable, which has to be produced with perfect quality. And this is a, a, a prototype.